So I'm Joan Barrison. I'm the Global Studies Program Coordinator at the college and the advisor to the Global Studies Club, which is the group that's sponsoring this event tonight. When the events in Ferguson happened, of course, students and faculty and staff at the college were quite upset, and it was definitely what I would call a teaching moment. That is a time where we really have to look and examine at what happened, what were the causes, and probably even more importantly, what could we do about it. So we decided that it was really important to do an event because when you're upset and angry, the worst thing is to be isolated. You know, to be sitting there by yourself feeling upset and feeling that there's nothing you can do. So that's why we're here tonight and we're glad that you're all here with us. You'll have a chance at the end when Cephas Johnson is finished speaking to ask questions and to make comments so we can process as a community together. Because we know at BCC, we have many Oscar, Brown, uh, Oscar Grants and Michael Browns. And we have to do everything we can to nurture and encourage them and protect them from the kind of violence that we saw in Ferguson. So thank you all for coming. Good evening and thank you for being here with us tonight. Before we continue, I'd like to ask if everyone out of respect for each other could please silence their phones. Thank you. I'm Bianca, I'm a fellow student here at BCC, as well as a member of the Global Studies Club. As a woman of color who was raised in the ghetto, both myself and my family have been subjected to racial targeting and violence at the hands of the police. We live in a society where we live under a constant threat of being the next victim of police violence, where the likelihood of us finding justice is slim to none. The murder of Oscar Grant, Michael Brown, Von Der Rey Myers Jr., as well as the continued mass incarceration of minorities are not isolated instances, but rather direct examples of institutionalized racism that continues to plague our society. Our only hope at withstanding this epidemic of police terrorism is for us to stand with each other and build stronger communities. With that being said, it is an honor to have Cephas Johnson here with us tonight. Cephas Uncle Bobby Johnson is the principal at the Love Not Blood Campaign Foundation and the principal and founder of the Oscar Grant Foundation. Uncle Bobby is an indispensable resource for families suffering from police violence and community violence, seeking to cope with the tragedy of lo losing a family member to the injustice of police terrorism and gun violence. Uncle Bobby brings families together to build bonds and strengthen themselves while fighting for the justice of their murdered loved ones. He has worked with the families of Trayvon Martin, Jordan Davis, Ramarley Graham, Kenneth Chamberlain, as well as many other families across our nation. Uncle Bobby has delivered numerous speeches on issues of police terrorism, mass incarceration, and criminalization of our youth. He has appeared on scores of radio and television stations, offering insight and strategies for communities working with families who seek justice. Furthermore, he has developed a detailed action plans for improving community and police relations, reforming police practice, and ending police terrorism. Without further ado, I welcome Cephas Uncle Bobby Johnson to present with us tonight. All right, well, again, uh, thank you, Bianca. Thank you, Joan, for having me here. And of course, thank you, students here at uh, Berkeley City College for uh, coming to this event and allowing me to be able to share my experience in Ferguson, but I think also um, who Oscar was as my nephew and then tying the two together so that we can see what time it is, because uh, we are at a state of emergency. You know, and so I am extremely happy to see so many of you in here um, to hear this discussion. But I'm also um, excited to hear from you. So I'm definitely, definitely want to leave time for you to ask questions, 
so that we can have a conversation because it's really all about you. It is not about me. It is about you and your babies. You know, and I, I say this consistently because I know exactly what time it is because of what happened to my nephew, uh, being in Ferguson, seeing what happened to Michael Brown, and I can go on with the names, Kenneth Harding, Harding Alan Bluford, Ernest Duane, Andy Lopez. You know, many of you that live here in the state of California in the Bay Area have heard these names. And then we got many names outside the state. So first, uh, so that I can um, be clear, is there anyone that don't know who Oscar Grant is first? Okay, so everyone here knows the story of Oscar Grant. So right before I leave Oscar to get into Ferguson, I want to share a couple of things with you about what happened inside the courtroom. Um, first off, the young man that was uh, speaking in there is Tommy Cross. He was a student at San Francisco State. He saw the issue that was happening on the platform, and he began to record. Uh, his video was one of the main videos um, that was used in the trial to get the first officer in the state of California history charged, arrested, convicted, and sent to jail. That was historical. So um, video recording at a safe distance is something that we always emphasize because the video documentation, as my sister said, had we had not had that, none of us would know who Oscar Grant is today. We have to be clear of that. We have to understand that. And so we have to become our brother's keeper and work with one another within our communities in order to help a family like ours, as you can hear my sister cry, um, you know, that video documentation was, was critical. So the very first day in trial, the judge told us that if we don't make all of you go away, we'll make the case last five, seven, ten years, or until all of you voluntarily go away. That was the first day. In the middle of the trial, they took the silhouette of Oscar's body, and the defense attorney named it KKK. Now, the silhouette is showing how the bullet went through his back, making the argument that we can prove he was resisting arrest, and therefore, what happened to him was a result of his own actions. This was the argument. And the defense attorney named it KKK. The judge accepted it, and it was thrown into evidence as KKK. It was in no alphabetical order nor chronological order, and the mass media reporters refused to really share that with the world because they was being admonished for different things they were reporting in the courtroom. And on the last day of the court, Judge Robert Perry said to us, my God, this is not about black and white. We just gave you a black president. Okay. That's just, I'm just telling you what happened inside the courtroom. So you can imagine. All in between those times, what we went through, it was extremely difficult to hear my nephew get murdered in the courtroom, criminalized, dehumanized, and even just demoralized in the courtroom to justify that shooting. And we could see somewhat of that getting ready to take place with Michael Brown. But I'm telling you, it's the community that stood with us, cried with us, went back and forth to court with us, prayed with us, and most importantly, utilized your First Amendment right to speak to that very injustice of what happened to Oscar. And as you saw, the Oakland Police Department began to fire on the community in Oakland. Not to the degree of what we saw in Ferguson, but it happened to here. So we're not exempt from what happened in Ferguson not happening here. So we have to be clear that the militarization of the police is real. What we witnessed in Ferguson, you would be appalled at. And you've got a glimpse of what happened, but really, right now, as you know, what's really going on in Ferguson, none of us is really getting the true details of it because mass media is not covering it like it initially did. And there's reasons behind that. But I wanted to add this, too. Judge Robert Perry claimed he erred with his instructions to you when you came back with a guilty verdict on the gun enhancement charge. So now you're hearing the evidence. You all conclude that there, it was a gun used. He's uh, liable, and therefore, we come back with a guilty verdict on the gun enhancement charge, which is an automatic 10 years. That's when they talked about the minimum was 12 years. But a gun enhancement charge would have put it at 12 years 
But Judge Robert Perry claimed he made a mistake. Remember, Johannes Mesley said he made a mistake. Now we got a judge saying he made a mistake with his instructions to you. He could not accept your verdict. He took it off the table, wiped off the 10 years, and then gave him two days served for each day in jail. There was a reason behind that formula because what he wanted to do was make sure that Johannes Mesley didn't go to prison. In the state of California, 12 months or longer, you go get sent to prison. So he was able to reduce it down to 11 months where he stayed in Men, uh, L.A. Men's County Jail for only 11 months. He gets out, he's put on non revocable parole, which means he doesn't have to report to a probation officer, parole officer, and at the end of one year, he automatically gets his weapon back and the felony falls off record. And then life goes on. And he goes back and reapplies at a police force somewhere. Right now, we know he's down in Southern California with a gun on the side doing the same thing he did in the Bay Area. So this is what we're dealing with. This is truly the experience of what happened in Ferguson. <coughs> Darren Wilson, the officer that killed Michael Brown, used to work for the Jennings Police Department, which is a city or municipality right outside of Ferguson. That's police department was so corrupt with racism that they had to totally destroy that police department. Darren Wilson then ended up in Ferguson. They rehired new officers at that um, Jenny Police Department hoping to get rid of all the racism that they had within it. Darren Wilson took with him the acts that he did in Jennings because he was uh, known to have beat up a young man, not just one, but a few in the Jenny Police Department before he came to Ferguson. So he was, he was known. Of course, when he gets to Ferguson, as you know, the story is, he tells Michael Brown to get off the street. They have a few words. He actually grabs Michael, and Michael's been struggling to get a loose, and the gun goes off. And when the gun goes off, Michael takes off running. I think he's, a, we, we hear, hear from the community, he was hit when the gun went off, then he shot again while he's running, turns around, puts his hands up, and as you know, he was shot several more times, eventually the last put in the top of his head. So as we know, right now before the grand jury, the grand jury could have came back, you know, with some form of a verdict, but now it's been put off until January. I said everything about Oscar so that we can listen to what could come out of this, what's gonna happen in January. Chances are, Everything stick to history, he'll be let go with a justifiable homicide. This happens 99 and 3 quarters of the time across the United States. Oh, the mic went off. I hope, did, uh, we, we on, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I hope you heard me a little earlier. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you know. Um, the Millerization in Ferguson is real. We landed in Ferguson two days after the murder. It happened on a Saturday. Monday night we were in Ferguson. Monday night we went down to the visual where he was murdered at. Uh, met many of the community members. Uh, went out on Ferguson, the whole Canfield area. People all out really, really um, upset about what happened. You know, and so just a backdrop of where the community was at they had been suffering decades of, of real oppression and racism. Uh, and one of the things that was really put on the community there, especially the black folks, was the fact that they were being ticketed or traffic violations was one of the main incomes that was used for all the different municipalities. Now get this, a municipality is like a little city uh, and they had 92 of those throughout the area. So you can drive through one city have a headlight out, get a ticket, and get into the other city and get another ticket. So there was much income derived from the community of folks there behind traffic violations. 92 municipalities in that area, and this is going on consistently. Actually, oh, I, I didn't tell my wife, by the way, this is my wife Beatrice who stands right next to me and deals with the families. Uh, we just got a, 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 a letter in the mail. Uh, we got a ticket. We got to deal with. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, okay. And I don't even remember getting, we didn't never get stopped, so I don't know how that ticket got to the house. 
<laughs> but we just, now what I'm saying is that I know what they're talking about because this is a $100 ticket that I don't even know what we got it for. Now I got to deal with that. And of course, if I don't deal with it, if I go back to Ferguson, I'll probably have a warrant for my arrest. And this could be a warning to me that if I come back and I haven't taken care of that, I will be arrested. Or a warrant may be put out for me. So something we got to deal with. But anyhow, that's just the reality. <laughs> and some of these municipalities, by the way, have 700 people in the little city. They have their own little police department. They have their own little city council. They have their own mayor. 700 people. Can you imagine? So this is what the community was going through. So when Michael was murdered, they brought out with them that form of depression, or not depression, but oppression, and experiences of racism that they was just going through on a regular basis. So it wasn't a riot. It wasn't a, uh, a looting. It was basically a rebellion, a response to the pain and the agony that they had been put up under for decades. You know, and so that was the response. And the community rose up. There was nothing like that spirit that we had ever witnessed everywhere we've been. We've been with the Trayvon Martin family down there when the community stood up. We've been in New York with the Ramali Graham family. Uh, we've been with the Ronaldo Cuevas family. I, can, I mean, families just right here in the Bay Area down south uh, in L.A. with uh, the Ortega's family, with just so many different families. But there was no community or, or, or family community that had the experience that we witnessed in Ferguson. These young people, despite the militarization that they were facing, stood up. And they stood up without fear because they knew that at this point in time, because so many young men are being killed on a regular basis across this country, that they had to say something. So they went on and just looked past them, their own personal uh, well-being to speak to this very issue. And what we witnessed was people from all over the U.S. coming into Ferguson to feel this spirit. It was nothing like we had ever experienced. And a good friend of mine, Joey, in the back said, it was like he had never felt so free. For him, it was uh, unbelievable, because I know Joey to be, be, have gone some of many places, too. But the, to see these young people being fired upon, gas canisters being thrown at them, rubber bullets being shot at them, a uh, young female shot twice. I mean, the bruises that she had, but she was so determined to stand up to speak to this issue. So I'm sharing with you how important it is that we as a community, one, become our brother's keeper. Anytime you see a young man, young female, or anyone accosted by the police, stand at a safe distance and begin to record. Because we are absolutely clear, had it not been for you videotaping what happened to Oscar, None of us would know who Oscar is, and we wouldn't even had been able to get to court. Most of these families don't even get to court. You know, and that video documentation was so critical to making that happen. Oscar was shot in the back at 2.11 a.m. Adolf Grimes was shot in the back at two, about 2.30 a.m. the same night, and Robbie Tolan was shot in the back out of Belvedere, Texas. The same night, all three black, all three 22 years old, all shot on the same night, all shot in the back. Robbie lives, Adolph Grimes died, and Oscar died. But not too many people know anything about Adolph Grimes or Robbie Tolan. Is there anyone in here heard of Robbie Tolan? He was shot the same night Oscar was. Anyone here of Adolph Grimes? Okay, a couple. He was shot the same night Oscar was. But nobody knows about this because, one, again, there was no video recording, and two, what was the community response to those shootings? The community rose up here in Oakland. It was critical in that response that I'm telling you propelled California, or we'll say the Bay Area, for um, Johannes Mesley to be arrested, charged, convicted, and sent to jail. Had that not happened, 
even though we had the video, had that not happened, there wouldn't have been no conviction. And a part of that also we always have to remember is how the labor force got involved. The IOWU, Local 10, the Longshoremen Union out of San Francisco, when I spoke to them, they decided to support the family, and then they put in a work stoppage day, which they stopped the, the um, unloading of the ships on the ports down here on the West Coast. And of course, it was an economic hit on the state of California. It was a combination of the community, labor, and the outrageness of seeing what happened to Oscar that made that happen. The same thing is happening in Ferguson. And so I'm, I'm here to share with you that it is not about me. It is not about us elders. It is all about you. And if you fail in your responsibility to stand up and speak to this issue, then you fail your future children and your future children babies because they are dependent on you to make this place, this society, a better place so that they can come up and be free from the harm that we're seeing happening to young men of color. You know, historically, we got to recognize how critical that is because we as black folks know that the last part of days of lynching, on an average, there was two lynchings a week. The Malcolm X grassroots reported right before Eric Gardner was killed that every 28 hours, a black man, black female, or black child would be killed across the United States. Every 28 hours. That didn't include the Brown brothers and sisters. But since Eric Gardner, the man that was choked to death in New York, there's been an average of two killings per day, every day, since Eric Gardner. It is happening so fast that if you talk about one, you get confused and trying to figure out, is this the same one we're talking about? Because it was one in Ohio, and it was one in Savannah, Georgia. You know, are, are we talking about the same one, or are we talking about two different ones? You're talking about two different ones. But it's happening so fast and so consistently that if we fail to recognize that and begin to stand up and support what's happening in Ferguson, then we do our, ourselves an injustice, but more importantly, we do our babies an injustice. And I, I want to do a time check. Okay. All right. I definitely want to make sure that I... <laughs> uh, plenty of time. Okay. I definitely want to make sure I hear from you because, you know, as I say, it's, it's not about us, but it is about you. But not only do I, I want to... Not only do I want to hear from you, but I'd like to know what it is that you're going to do today to help change the conditions that we're witnessing. Because I'm telling you, Ferguson is not just looking within Ferguson. They're looking across the United States for support in this movement. They just had a tremendous big weekend. And if you've kind of been getting a glimpse of what happened, you know, Cornell West was arrested. Uh, so many of the clergymen from the Bay Area was arrested just this past weekend for going to Ferguson and speaking to this very issue. We're not that far removed from what we saw. We saw a glimpse of it with Oscar and just recently a protest that occurred for Michael Brown here in Oakland was, was met with basically militarization police right here in Oakland. So first we got to overcome the fear. And the fact is, once we overcome the fear and realize that if we speak to this issue, stand and face off, that we actually can begin to bring about this change. I'm going to, uh, I'm basically going to end this with, um, you know, this, this, this picture that I want to leave you with. You know, we got to ask ourselves, what is the role of the police? Because we used to believe it was to serve and protect. I don't know about you, but that's what I used to believe. And we used to see that on the cars, to serve and protect. The role of the police is not to serve and protect the people. It is here to serve and protect the state. We have to understand that once we get clear on the role of the police and who they're here to serve and protect, then we can begin to move forward in dealing with a system that is by design set up to become more of a state 
system and controlling that 1% or protecting that 1% or the state and yet bringing down terror on us. You know, it is not about us. It is about your babies. It is about your children's future and their children after them. That leadership we saw in Ferguson from the young people was powerful. So we're absolutely clear that it is you that's going to take the new leadership of this movement. So I'd just like to open this up for questions. Uh, you know, let me hear from you. Thank you. So we'd like to ask people to come line up here. You'll have a couple of minutes to speak, and we'll let Cephas respond as he wants to. You can ask a question or make a comment or talk about your own experience or whatever you feel like discussing. I want to let you know that this event is being filmed by two different filmmakers. So if anybody feels uncomfortable about being filmed, if you just put your hand up before you speak, you won't be filmed. If, if you're cool with it, then you will be filmed. And this event will be shown eventually on Peralta TV. So you can actually watch it and tell other people about it who couldn't make it here tonight. So are there people who would like to come forward and, and uh, speak? Find your voices, folks. How's it going? I'm well, thank you. <laughs> I'm Espen. Um, I just want to know if you've seen in all these movements around the country what has given most results. I mean, what's, uh, what's made the biggest change in uh, a community and how the cops interact with the people there? Did everyone hear that question? No? no? Okay, let me see. <laughs> uh, I was asking what made the biggest uh, changes or results, um, protest-wise or demonstration-wise, and, uh, you know, what was his experience of um, these community protests? So I'll tell you what, uh, now I don't know if it's really brought the biggest change, but it brought the biggest visuality to what's really going on. Uh, you know, nobody advocates just burning down every building, but we have to be clear. What happened in Oakland when those buildings caught on fire brought a lot of attention to Oakland, and then people began to hear who Oscar was. You know, and of course, then from that, the movement took place, and people began to demonstrate and talk about the issue. Had that rebellion in Ferguson not happened, because remember, they didn't have video for Michael. There's kind of partial video. But that rebellion took place, and buildings caught on fire. And it wasn't just a, uh, a, uh, like a riot where buildings was just burned. Really, those were targeted buildings because the business owner of those particular buildings had so much disrespect for the community that they were serving, those young people had already had been depressed, I mean, oppressed, and felt that they were being discriminated against by these particular buildings, and they became the target. And it was that that actually put Ferguson on the map. Now, with that being said, we're looking at the community coming to Ferguson, not just coming to Ferguson, but what communities are doing all across the United States. And because everybody is aware of the militarization, see, that peeled back something for us all to see, that the militarization of the police department is real. Ferguson gave you a glimpse of where the U.S. is going when it be is becoming a police state. So I would say that was one of the things that happen to help bring about this possible change that we can see. Thank you so much for coming out. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for coming out tonight. I appreciate listening to you. Um, I had a question regarding Eric Holder because he has now left and this is the first shooting where we've really seen federal level, the federal level stepping in. Um, and I'm wondering how you feel that will affect the case. 
and also if that's partially why we have less momentum in the media. Well, I'll tell you, basically in every high profile case, the Department of Justice say they will get involved. In the Oscar case, the Department of Justice is still investigating. In the Trayvon Martin case, the Department of Justice is still investigating. In the Rob Molly Graham case, the Department of Justice is still investigating. And I could go on with the names of the cases where the Department of Justice actually got involved. But now the question is, I mean, saying you're investigating but actually doing something is two different things. So we're still waiting on the results. Eric Holder went to Ferguson to really to appease the community and the U.S. in regards to how we was visualizing what was happening in Ferguson. And so now the question remains, well, what are they going to do? They already know the racism that exists within that community. They understand the municipalities and what's happening. But I tell you from not just a distance, but from being there, one of the things that they're doing now is having these, uh, it's called, the Department of Justice have what you call community, uh, uh, what do they call community? Um, community town halls, but they have a, a community representative. And that community representative that speaks on behalf of the Department of Justice is controlling who actually now comes to those town hall meetings. That's another way to diffuse and water down the issue that is happening in Ferguson. So uh, if the question is, do we believe that Eric Holder, you know, even though he's gone, that the Department of Justice is going to bring some positive change? I do not put a lot of faith in that, because we're still waiting on Oscar. Mm. You're welcome. Uh, hello. I, again, I'd like to say, you know, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, but to me, this kind of, this uh, new age of police brutality that our country seems to be facing more and more now um, seems like it's more it's come more to light in the recent it's in the past you know ten years. Uh, can you maybe shed some light on on maybe why uh, the police is uh, the police forces have kind of um, been more brutal and and why they've they've kind of taken hold at the way that they have is there. Have you seen any trends in the police forces in the recent years? That have so uh, to say, first, we, we have to be clear that it's always been going on, but maybe not to the degree that we're seeing it today. Um, Tommy Cross, as we talked about uh, in Caught on Tape, pulled out his camera. So we can, uh, we can say a lot of the technology that we have within our hands has been helping to reveal the heinous act of these rogue police officers that exist in the community. But it also peels back the fact that if we know that these rogue police officers exist and we still want to say that they're good police officers, but the good police officers doesn't report on the bad police officers, as far as I'm concerned, and this is me speaking, then the good one is just as culpable as the bad one. I mean, he's just as bad, you know. So with everyone with the camera in their hands and the police department are now being equipped with lapel cameras, it only behooves them to begin to report on those bad apples. I mean, now, we can say, will that change um, the murders that we see? Uh, that's, uh, uh, for me, I would say no, not necessarily. When they got, here's an example. When they disbanded the Jennings Police Force there in St. Louis, Missouri, or not St. Louis, Missouri, but Missouri, they hired new officers. They were all white, and they was hoping to bring these new officers on with a better attitude to people of color. And what they ended up getting was the same thing that they had just recently got rid of. And so is there's an innate culture behind the history of the police that has, um, is, is something that just seemed to not go away. So, you know, that to me really is the issue, is the, the culture that we are witnessing and seeing, and then what is the society really emphasizing? You know, I mean, we're uh, imperialistic, we got major global issues going on all around the world, you know, and so we're questioning uh, our involvement 
and the things that are happening around the world when it comes to uh, innocent people being murdered. But yet at the same time, we have the same thing happening here at the United States uh, that we seem to be turning a blind eye to. So we all have a responsibility to begin to bring this out to light like we're doing. Technology has helped, but the reality of it is it's been going on for years, but we're seeing so much more of it now. It's just unbelievable. Everybody's becoming aware, and the militarization was key to what happened in Ferguson to allow us to see just how the United States is actually preparing itself for just from different communities. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I want to say thank you, um, and thank you for all of you that are here today. Um, it's really exciting to see so many people interested. I remember when this first happened, um, we were trying to s talk to students about, you know, how do we relate to what happens every day in Oakland, um, these stories that you see, and, and a lot of people saying, well, that's happening there, and nothing, no movement is happening here. Um, and I think it's it starts with coming to events like this, but not only that, um, I think it's really the question that you're asked at the very end is what role does the state play? And what role do we play in the state? You know, what, where, where do we want to focus our time? Uh, a lot of us um, say that we, you know, we need to work, we need to go to school, we need to uh, just to get by. But at the same time, those uh, fight backs and those struggles that you face day in and day out are things that you can relate to other people. Um, if you talk about them, and um, it isn't just about you know police brutality, but it's it's about um, not being able to afford the bus. It's not. It's about not being able to uh, you know um, the the fact that that the system has created so many divisions for us, you know, um, and that racism is a concept that we think has always existed, and it's not true. So. I think these are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves and really talking to people about and trying to be active about this, you know, and really um, finding finding the answers and finding other people that we can relate to, um, and and seeing like can we can we make time? Do this is a choice, you know. We need to make the time from our busy lives to just to get by to to do something about this. So. Um, Again, thank you all, and uh, if you guys are interested in talking to people that wanting to do something about this, like I am interested in talking to you all too. Uh, thank you on that, and, and I'll try to quickly just uh, say something. I've spoken at um, Cal Berkeley, and they actually are putting themselves together to do a big event on October the 22nd. I just spoke over at uh, San Francisco State, and they actually are now planning to do a big event on October 22nd. You know, and so it's our hope that um, right here at Berkeley City College, um, getting with the student that just spoke, you know, that you also um, look at doing something in regards, because remember, it's one thing for me to come up here and talk about Ferguson, to talk about Oscar, and you hear this, but if there's no action behind hearing it, then we become just as culpable allowing this system to continue to perpetuate the type of harm and racism that we see going on consistently. So we have to become involved. You're students. You know, you're the new leaders of this movement. And, you know, like Cal Berkeley may march from Berkeley all the way to Oscar Grant Plaza. You know, well, you should be connecting with them. If not connecting with them, doing your thing here at Berkeley City College, but speaking to the issue. Oh, thank you. Um, just want to appreciate all the comments and, and, and what you've shared with us and really sort of what you said about turning it back to us, right? I mean, part of what happens is the way we relate to the state is we relate to the state as spectators. Um, instead of us having real democracy, we're, we're watching it all on TV and hoping that the next politician in four years from now will save us when in fact they just reinforce the status quo. I mean, that was one of the things that was powerful about Occupy is you had people coming together and reclaiming the commons on a, on a 
consistent basis, talking to people, connecting the dots between their different realities and the, the seeds of what it might look like for real citizen-controlled government, right? A government that's really of the people and by the people were being planted, and that's why they had to get rid of the camps, because you have people coming together to reclaim the commons. And so for me, one of the, sh one of the le strategy lessons from that and from Ferguson and, and from so many movements of the past is if our enemies don't want us coming together, if our enemies don't want us paying attention, cop watching, et cetera, that's exactly what we need to do. Um, so there's a group of us, for example, who met in Occupy who uh, say one way to reclaim the commons is to reclaim the budget, right? So instead of people just, you know, hoping that good things come from what the government does, we get to decide uh, exactly what the government does by controlling the, the money, right? So a group of us have written a voter initiative in Oakland uh, to make it so the people of Oakland directly decide the budget. It's called the Community Democracy Project. And so imagine people getting together on a regular basis and be able to decide how much money goes to police, how much money goes to parks, how much money goes to et cetera. So instead of people having this relationship of government of like uh, this paternalistic, oh, the government's this force above us, and we're just spectators, the government, the politicians and the officials have to come to the people and say, please, we want more tanks or we want whatever. And the people say, no, you know, we want more money to go to things that help us instead of harm us, right? Why is 50% of our federal taxes going to the military, right? So we need to reclaim that. Um, so that's one example of a long-term strategy to reclaim the commons, and there's many others. Go ahead. He said it all. That was good. <laughs> So, oh, sorry. My question is is for for us that are like farther removed and stuff without the cameras and the actual evidence of the brutality, how do we decipher based on what we're hearing from the media and stuff which things that we're hearing are actually police brutality versus like what they're act like what they're saying? Like how how do we decipher if it was quote unquote a clean shoot and the police were doing it because somebody did have a weapon and was aimed at them versus somebody not actually having a weapon and it is police brutality, but there's no cameras, like we can't actually s see it. So how do we figure out what's going on as, as bystanders who weren't there and who, who didn't s physically see anything and were only getting media influence? Uh, uh, well, of course, uh, we know that there may be some real shooting versus um, those that were unarmed. Uh, since Eric Gardner, I'll say at least 99% of those that has been killed every two a day were unarmed. Um, and so the, the issue is uh, the media as well as the police immediately begin to criminalize and dehumanize the individual. And so we as, as the masses have a tendency to believe what we're hearing when it comes to mass media making the report. And then the police department saying, like Michael Brown, uh, you know, was actually charging the officer. But, you know, you'd have been shot four or five times and you're falling forward, and then you get shot in the top of your head. You know, we have to just look at the details uh, and understand that most of the time, 99% of the time, the individual will be criminalized. Oscar allegedly was reaching for a gun, as Johannes Mesley said, and he shot Oscar in the back and then later claimed he made a mistake by meaning to pull his taser versus his gun. If we look at the individual his history, because each shooting really becomes a question with the jury that the state of mind of the officer at the time of the shooting. So if we are privy to know the officer's history, now Congress, a piece of legislation called the Peace Officers Bill of Rights protect officers from us knowing their history. But here's an example of Johannes Mesley and I gave an example of um, Darren Wilson. Darren Wilson had a history at the Jenin Police Department. Johannes Mesley had beat up four young African-American black men before he murdered Oscar. So if we look at the history of the officer, we can better deduce the probability of whether that was uh, a, a non-intentional shooting or an intentional shooting. And then we get a better understanding of whether the individual had a gun. Because whenever they say allegedly, 90% of the time they didn't have a weapon. You know? And so 
It's just a matter of looking at the whole picture and coming to a better understanding and, and truly understanding that the police force lie consistently and regularly about that. Hello, hello. Hi, Hi. thank you for being here. Um, I have a quick anecdote and a question. Uh, first of all, I try to march as much as I can, justice for everybody, you know, and I'm, I'm marching along and we're yelling justice for Trayvon Martin, justice for Oscar Grant, and I'm wondering if we can sort of chew on that word for a second and ask what justice would look like and what it means. Um, I typically ask someone next to me, say, hey, what does justice look like? And um, I love your hat, by the way. Um, and so what I, what I love about this engagement thus far is not only to see fellow instructors and students here, but uh, this, this highlighting of the role of the state in this issue. And um, I'm a prison abolitionist, right? And so what that means is I view the state as a very source of violence and oppression, and the state being sort of organized entity over with monopoly control over violence in a given territory. Right? That's how I would define it. And uh, sorry. And so anyways, if I view the state as a source of my oppression and I'm marching for justice and I hear that someone gets off, they get two years, I'm pissed about it, right? I'm like, man, this person should be going to solitary confinement, Rikers Island, let's get this person locked up forever. And I'm hit dramatically almost with a sense of contradiction, right, to support the very system that is the source of our impression. And I see that system as then the source of my liberation and it's a hard thing for me. So I'm wondering what you would have to share about that and if we could think about that together. Wow, okay. So uh, I heard, um, what does justice look like? Okay. Now, for me, justice look like every young man, specifically black and brown, have the right to life. And that is that they're uh, not criminalized, not dehumanized, uh, you know, and, uh, and their sense of respect in their families is not uh, taken away. So for me, justice is that everyone, again, black and white, is treat treated equally. There's um, justice and equality and freedom for all. You know, and that's what it looks like for me. Yeah. Um, my name's Joey Johnson. I traveled to Ferguson with uh, Cephas, with Uncle Bobby, and uh, both of us going there on behalf of the Stop Mass Incarceration Network, and I also went there on behalf of Revolution Newspaper, who I'm a correspondent for. I more have a question and, a, and a, a question for the audience and a comment, um, which is, how many people here, and I really just want an honest show of hands, you know, people shouldn't feel uh, self-conscious or whatever. When the uprising happened, when the rebellion happened in Ferguson after the murder of Michael Brown, how many other people here like really wish they were there at the time? Damn, that's that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that that's heartwarming. <laughs> I wish you all were, were all were there with us, you know. It, but I'll tell you this: the people that we met were very uh, appreciative and gave us embraces like all the time, hugs. And when we told them we came from the Bay Area to to stand with them, and I want to say that on October 21st, excuse me, October 22nd, next Wednesday the National Day of Protest, you have your chance to, again, to be there, to stand with the people of Ferguson by being in downtown Oakland, by coming together. Cephas mentioned that the students over at San Francisco State, we were there this morning talking with them, and they're going to all come together in, in their quad at the Malcolm X Plaza and do a die-in and do chalk outlines around the bodies, symbolizing people being murdered by the police. You know, and get up and rally together and do poetry and then they're going to come together to, to downtown Oakland. Folks from Chabot College, from Laney, from Cal, from Contra Costa Community College, from high schools. That downtown Oakland needs to be hundreds, if not thousands, of people. We've got to come together in this kind of way. The people in Ferguson 
are refusing to live like this, you know? And I think it's important people here understand the stakes. When Cephas is running down all these victims of official brutality, when you add that to this country having more people in prison than any other country in the world, more juveniles in prison, more juveniles doing life without po possibility of parole. Think about that for a minute. We're talking about teenagers, children, doing life without possibility of parole. It really is, if you understand this, uh, a, a genocide, a slow genocide that's gathering momentum. In the news, they talked about why did all these uh, guns get redistributed to the Pentagon to all these cities around the country, and they say, well, the Pentagon had them. They just wanted to pass them out. Bullshit. They did it because they see ways waging counterinsurgency against the millions of people that live in the inner cities across this country that have no real future under this system. Waging counterinsurgency against them, just like they're waging counterinsurgency in villages in Iraq. This is why it's so important that the people in Ferguson stood up and said, we're not going to live like this anymore. But I agree with Cephas. Don't count. These, this grand jury thing is like a vehicle for a cover-up, you know? The DA could have directly indicted the, the cop that murdered Michael Brown and then gone to an evidentiary hearing. But this is a way of like, just like with people remember Andy Lopez, a 13-year-old boy in Santa Rosa who had a toy gun was murdered by the, they waited it out for nine months before they came back with the non, with the grand or with their decision, the prosecutor's decision not to charge. We have to take this initiative. The people in Ferguson have erected a giant stop sign to this and shine the light on it like hasn't happened in a very long time. And we got to keep that momentum. So regardless of where you're coming from, your understanding, be downtown Oakland on October 22nd for the National Day of Protest. There's cities across the country that are doing this, from, from New York to LA to Atlanta. Ferguson is doing it on October 22nd. Let's come together that day. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, when I first started speaking, I spoke about the very first day in court and how Judge Robert Perry told us that if we don't make the crowd go away, he'll make this case last five, seven, ten years or until all of you go away. Well, this grand jury being moved to January, it's designed to do specifically that. It is hoping that you just go back to your normal lives and forget about what's happening in Ferguson so that everything can go back to the way it's getting. And so it is real important that we don't let that happen. And that's what the young people in Ferguson is saying. They are out there 24 hours a day, every day. They're not going to let uh, this put off until January uh, make them just go home and forget about what happened to Michael Brown. But we here as a community, as Joy was sharing, cannot also let that happen. That's why it's so important that we become just as involved because being involved right here really puts you in Ferguson because we're all speaking to the very same issue. So that's why we hope, you know, that you come out and be a part of this movement that's happening all across the United States. And right here in this Bay Area is the heart of activism. This is ground zero right here. My name is Lorenzo Ramsey. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. And first and foremost, I wanted to say that I'm sorry for your loss. I'm also an uncle. Um, I also wanted to thank you for mentioning some of the names that we are not aware of, the ones that did not make the news. Um, I shared with my uh, sociology class recently that when my nephew was about 11 years old, the Dearborn, Michigan police, the same city where Renisha uh, McBride was murdered, they came into the city of Inkster where uh, my family lived, and my nephew and his cousins, which were around the same age, they were playing in the front yard, and the police came over jumped on them and pulled guns on them. My nephew, who was, I believe, 11 at the time, had an asthma attack, and they laughed at him. My sister was standing there and could do nothing. Um, the, a young man remarked that, you know, why is this happening now? This has never stopped. Mm -hmm. I grew up 
in the city of Detroit with a black mother who every single time she passed a police officer, if she saw a white officer and a black person in the car, she instantly started prayer. Mm. That was my experience growing up. I was literally trained what to do and what not to do to stay alive if ever pulled over by a police officer. That is my experience. I'm new to California and I have great respect for people who get together and protest. However, in my personal viewpoint, I don't necessarily see how the chalkings and the things like that are going to change the minds of the judges like what you were experiencing in your case. When my family called the news, we were told that it wasn't newsworthy because Princess Diana had just died. Mm -hmm. right. In a system that doesn't care about kids who get attacked by police, where we have videotapes of a police officer murdering your nephew, what can we do institutionally? I hear about political activism, I hear about body cameras, but in order for the system to change, we have to take responsibility and vote these people out and change the system. <laughs> what else is it because You've seen these patterns, you've been with these families. What else can we do, each and every single one of us, whether it's from Detroit, whether it's Ferguson, whether it's here, to take personal responsibility and change the institutions that are built for our decimation? The question is, what can you do? You know, I, I, I share this story all the time about Rosa Park. You know, uh, right now, you're hearing this conversation, you're listening to me, and you're listening to your peers speak about this issue. And seeds are being planted. And Rosa Park was at an, an event very similar to this, hearing the discussion of Emmett Till. And when she was asked to get up out of her seat, she was so appalled at the, the fact that racism was so blatant and the fact that Emmett Till, the image was in her mind, she refused to get up. So she took a stand. So you have to really see this system as it truly is. And if you are appalled at living in a system that has been perpetrating the harms and the crimes of not just people here in the States, but across the world, and you fail to stand up and speak to that issue, you are just as culpable. It's like I said about the police. If the police, good police officer does not report on his partner who just beat me down and he's black, he's just as culpable. So we as a community, if we see this system like this, have to begin to take action in the ways that will bring about a better society for your babies. You know, and so there's much to be done, but it starts with getting involved. It starts with really um, uh, having the empathy to walk in my shoes or Oscar's shoes, you know, recognizing that he was a human being and he had a right to life. And though he might have made some mistakes, he had the right to redemption. You hear what I'm saying? And so until we take that into our heart and see an issue with someone across the street that don't look like me and don't say something about it or get involved, then you're really a part of the problem. 